Uh, the judgment was 8-3 in favour of Parliament having a say so that Theresa May is not allowed to trigger Article 50 and begin our formal withdrawal process from the European Union without, first, the House of Commons and then our friends in the House of Lords having a say. In response to it, the Brexit Secretary, David Davis, says he's going to put forward a short bill, probably on Thursday of this week. I guess they're doing it as quickly as they can, but there are people lining up to put down amendments. We have Tim Farron, who, of course, wants us to have a second referendum because he simply can't bring himself to accept the result of the first one. Uh, the SNP, in similar vein, and the Labour Party, well, Jeremy Corbyn, as decisive as ever, he says Labour respects the results of the referendum and the will of the British people and will not frustrate the process of invoking Article 50. So it sounds clear, and then you get the next sentence, when he added that his party would seek to amend the Article 50 bill to prevent the Conservatives using Brexit to turn Britain into a bargain basement tax... I mean, just, you know, I've no idea actually where Jeremy Corbyn stands on this, other than his party is pretty split on this, but I'm certain there'll be Labour MPs that vote outright uh, to stop Article 50 being triggered. But either way, the real question here is, do you think that this is a good day or a bad day for democracy? And the reason I say that, is that it took many, many years to force David Cameron as Prime Minister into promising the British people a referendum. In the end, we got to it. And when the campaign began, he put out a, a, a leaflet. One went to every house in the country from HM government. I was furious. They spent £9 million putting out a leaflet telling us how wonderful the European Union had been, for jobs, the economy, security, and so on. But there was a very important page in this document. It said it was a once-in-a-generation decision. And he couldn't have been clearer. Cameron said, this is your decision. The government will implement what you decide. Namely, normally we, in Westminster, make the laws by which you're governed. But for once, just this once, this is your decision. It's something called direct democracy. And we made our decision and we voted to leave. And the very idea that we're going to hand back this decision to the very group of people in the House of Commons who've spent nearly 50 years leading us on a path towards full European political union without ever telling us what their true intentions were, I am horrified and, frankly, pretty angry about. I think voters are being treated with complete and utter contempt, and I think there's a large section of the establishment in this country who will attempt to do whatever they can to dilute or delay the whole Brexit process. So tell me, perhaps you think, perhaps you think it's great that this is going back to Parliament. Perhaps you think the people themselves shouldn't ever have been given a referendum in the first place. I don't know. Perhaps, like me, you're becoming, and I am as the day goes on, becoming increasingly annoyed about all of this. Either way, let me know. It is the big question of the day. And to get involved, call me on 0345 6060 Text me at 84850. You can tweet me on at LBC. Don't forget the, ha the hashtag Farage and LBC. And you can watch the show live. Just go to LBC's Facebook page now. And we're going to crack straight on. And I'm going to ask Jacob in Coulsdon, is this a good day or a bad day for British democracy. It's a fantastic day for democracy. Oh, wow. Right. T tell me more, day. please. Because if you believe in democracy, you believe in a separation of powers between the executive, legislature and the judiciary. And if you believe in that, then you believe that the Supreme Court does not act in, with any political agenda in mind, but they act to preserve democracy and are more concerned, as far as Brexit is concerned, with the legality of the process. Now, a government win, in this instance whereby progress of powers can be uh, wielded to trigger Article 50, means that there is no care or consideration afforded to elected representatives to um, bring in a, a change that will have a material effect on domestic law, which, as I'm sure you know, progress of powers cannot do. So therefore, if we want to be upheld as a, a pinnacle of Western democracy, we need for those who we have elected to have a say in any effect on domestic UK law which a vote in the House of Commons will, once 
the issue uh, or the, the bill that's, uh, that's drawn up is presented to the House. So well, J- Jacob, Jacob, it's Jacob if it's that clear, democracy. Jacob, if it's that clear, how come it wasn't a unanimous decision then? I mean, I mean, it was very, very clear that, uh, you know, uh, Lord Newberger wanted it to be a unanimous decision. They must have wrangled quite hard over this. And still, three of the justices stood out against this decision, not believing it to be right. Yeah, I mean, my, my lunch break is only so long, so I don't have the time to read the dissenting judgments in full. However, what has perhaps coloured uh, their view is the context in which this particular change was, in this particular issue was brought about. You've got the preceding referendums, so you've got the will of the people being expressed, and therefore the government, for intents and purposes, wants to enact that will by being able to trigger Article 50, which is all well and good. However, the process is what we're concerned with. The issues, I think, are being conflated, and the media is getting hold of it and holding the, um, the Supreme Court up as some sort of challenge to democracy, whereas that's not what it's concerned with. What it's concerned so with is the process. Was it wrong, and, then? Was it wrong, then? for HM government to put a leaflet through every door in Britain saying, this is your decision, the government will implement what you decide. Was that a mistake? Were they not telling us the truth? I I don't think it was a mistake. I think it was misguided. I don't know know if you could call it a mistake, because if in in electing representatives, what you're doing is you're ceding some of your... um, you're, you're allowing them to make decisions that they believe will be in your best interest. So long as they can make a convincing case for that actually being reality, then they would expect for you to, to vote with your feet and therefore to back any proposals that they make. Now, regardless of what any Brexiteers campaigned for, if the people, have, as they have done, have turned around and said, no, we want to be out of the, um, out of the EU, then it is their responsibility as just that elected representatives to actually see that into fruition. So, well, whilst it was misguided for them to have... Jacob, to Jacob, you may call it misguided. I call it an outright deception, but I thank you uh, for your comments and your thoughts, and I wonder what Mark in Enfield thinks. A good day or a bad day for democracy, Mark? Oh, Nigel, hello. Doesn't it just make your blood boil? <laughs> it Even does mine, yeah. I knew, right, the result was... Go- I knew the ruling was going to go this way. But all those blinking weasel Ramonians saying that they respect the democratic decision taken by the British people on the 23rd of June, my blinking derriere, they respect the will of the British people. And the funniest thing that I heard uh, said by one of those weasels today was that this was a victory for democracy. Yeah. Now, can you believe it? I think that... Jacob Rees-Mogg, I think he, he put it perfectly when he said, he said, those who now wail parliamentary sovereignty mean the yoke of Brussels. When they say scrutiny, they mean delay. When they say respect, they mean condescension. condescension. The British people have voted and we must legislate. So, Mark, I mean, you feel as angry as this. I mean, what can you do about it? I mean, you can ring me and tell me your blood boils, and I actually rather agree with you. But what on earth are we going to do about this? I mean, perhaps we need a bigger political revolution than just the referendum result that we had in June of last year. Well, this is it. I I mean, I, I have to wonder... Is it going to have to go to a snap general election? Because Uh. these people are going to keep throwing spanners in Mm. the works. Mark, 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 I get that. I get that point. Thank you. Uh, The answer, I think, is, is this. Theresa May is naturally quite a cautious political leader. But I think the Labour Party are in one hell of a mess over this. Uh, they've got their Euro fanatics uh, in the party, and they've got a small handful of Eurosceptics. Uh, the Corbyn line from today, which I read out, is utterly confused, and I've no doubt they'll be voting in all different directions um, on this and on the amendments that get put down on the bill. Uh, remember that Labour are looking down the barrels at by-elections, which take place on the 23rd of February, so less than a month away. One is in Copeland, um, up on the Cumbrian coast. The other is in Stoke-on-Trent. They are both long-time Labour seats, but they are both seats in which the overwhelming majority of Labour voters voted for Brexit. If Corbyn's troops and the Commons are seen to be thwarting the will of the people in Copeland and Stoke-on-Trent, they will pay a heavy price, in fact, maybe heavier than just losing 
that by-election. Maybe that gives Theresa May the opportunity to go for a May general election and for the Labour Party to be wiped out. So, Mark, you made a good point there. The stakes are very high indeed. Uh, John, in Formby, Lancashire. Good day or bad day for democracy, John? Oh, well, I'm not too disheartened, as Bill Shankly said. We're not beaten yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> go on. I'd like to give you two things, an impression and a suggestion. Yep. The, the impression I have is... Um, uh, I'm reminded of two of my favourite films. Um, firstly, Bridge of the River Kwai. The Ramonas are just like Colonel Nicholson when he goes mad at the end and is in despair about the bridge being blown up. Yes. And uh, another film, uh, Zulu. The Ramonas are a bit like uh, Stanley Baker and Michael Caine defending the fort. They've got various fallback positions until they come to the final redoubt. <laughs> Well, John, thank you very much for that tour uh, of films. But is this a good day for democracy? Uh, I think it is a good day. Right, so do you... Uh, uh, be, be, because we can look at the positive. Yeah. We've, we've flushed these people out. I've been hearing disgusting stuff on the radio today about um, people who voted leave not being decent mm. and, and, and that uh, almost as if Polly Toynbee should be given 100 million votes and, and, and uh, other, other pe ordinary people... Uh, thick, northern, worthy-class people is basically what they're saying. Yeah. Uh, should only have half a vote. So what I would like to say is some um, way of sorting out the Constitution. And the point I would make is this, that Parliament should no longer be sovereign. It should be the people. Quite right, John. I'm 100% with you. It is the people of this country. That's where sovereignty lies. Your Facebook message is coming in. Gene Robertson says, Out should have meant out. The people voted in a national vote. Leroy Hollingsworth says, In the words of Theresa May, Brexit means Brexit. Well, yes, but not to many in the House of Commons. And Andrew McKinnon says, Stop whining and moaning, Nigel. British law is upheld and you say boo-hoo, get over it. Well, uh, it just depends whose interpretation of British law you're listening to. Uh, it also depends whether you have total confidence in the independence of a modern-day judiciary. Right now, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.15. Get that referendum, and when it did, a leaflet went through every door in Milan from HM government saying, this is your decision. The government will implement what you decide. And now, a group of wealthy business people, uh, many MPs in the House of Commons, many people in the House of Lords, sections of the media are trying to do everything they can to delay and dilute the whole Brexit process. And I've got a Facebook message here from David Phillips who says, appreciate what you're saying, but you wanted sovereignty and now argue against it. As the whole referendum was a complete pack of lies, I think we need to review where we're going as a country. David Phillips, you couldn't be more wrong. Sovereignty does not lie with Parliament. Sovereignty lies with the people. And once every five years or so, what we do is we exercise that by putting people, representatives, into the House of Commons to act on our behalf. The point about it, David, is they serve us. We don't serve them. And I think politics in this country has become so arrogant that actually they believe it's the other way around. They think we're too thick, we're too stupid, we're too ignorant. Most of them actually now don't think we should ever have been given a referendum in the first place. Sovereignty lies with the British people, not with the career politicians in Westminster. And I feel very, very strongly about that. I wonder what Chris in Temple thinks. Is this a good day, Chris, or a bad day for democracy? Well, it's most definitely a fantastic day for democracy because it's an example of one of the most respected judiciaries in the world mm. making a definition of significant, um, a decision of significance that affects a lot of the lives of many people. But really what I want to know from you, Nigel, is what is your legal argument for saying that the decision today was wrong? And I assume you think the decision today was wrong, judging by what you said, but what is your legal argument for saying that it's wrong? Well, I mean, clearly, the legal arguments, we can go around in circles, but basically, governments do have the ability to sign international treaties and to make big international decisions. Uh, and it seemed to me uh, that the way that uh, the 1972 European Communities Act uh, was adjudged in terms of its impact on British law, you could have viewed it either way, all right? And that's why, of course, it was, despite huge pressure, a split decision. So I think, Chris, we can agree uh, that perhaps Perhaps legally, perhaps legally, uh, you know, it is very difficult 
to say what is right and what is wrong. It's why we're here in the first place uh, that really concerns me, the fact that a group of very wealthy people are, who, who are doing very nicely, thank you very much indeed, uh, many of them who, uh, you know, I watched... Um, Charlie Mullins from Pimlico Plumbers saying that he wants as many foreign workers as possible because we haven't got the skills in Britain. Well, all right, Charlie, but we could start training our own people. The point I'm making, Chris, is the vested interests have done all they can to get us to this position today, and we will now see an attempt in Parliament to delay and dilute the process. I hope to goodness, I hope to goodness that there are enough MPs fearful for their own political futures to make sure that we don't finish up with some of these amendments getting through. But, Chris, Chris, that's how I feel about it. I, mean, I feel, Chris, that, that just occasionally we get the chance through direct democracy for the public to make a decision. And I feel, Chris, that's not being honoured. You see, Nigel, you, this, is, this isn't the point that I'm making. The point that I'm making and what you've just basically proved is you've given an extremely flimsy legal overview of what the problem is that shows that you don't understand. And my point... Ah, is so are you saying the three justices, Chris, didn't understand either? That's the point. It's an extremely contentious legal issue. I, I, you, I, I, I fully accept that. I fully accept that legally it's contentious. I'm asking why we're here in the first place. Why we're here in the first place yeah. is a challenge to the court. Well, it's clear. I mean, I, I personally think that the fault lies with the people who wrote the re legislation in the first place for not putting any legal effect to put in the referendum. But my real problem with what you're doing, Nigel, is the fact that you're calling into question the autonomy of the judiciary with no legal basis for why they're ah, wrong. OK. And okay. You, see, if, you see, my point is the fact that if you really think that there's a problem with autonomy, then come on this programme, say why you think the legal points are wrong, read the 100 pages of the judgment, read the opinion, and then say, this is clearly the wrong decision, and this is why they cannot be autonomous. But don't come on your programme. Well, I've got the judgment. Very, very I've, got the pro I've, I've got the judgment, Chris. And let me tell you, you know, this question about the independence of the judiciary, I did feel very strongly that, one... Um, of the judges in the lower court, uh, Lord Thomas, ha had been a career activist in promoting a political union of our legal systems. I don't think he should have made that judgment. And it's even questionable, perhaps, whether one of the people sitting today, Lady Hale, who appeared to have prejudged the whole thing some months ago at a conference out in the Far East, should have been there. So there are questions about whether... Uh, our judiciary is as, is as independent as it used to be. But I haven't attempted, Chris, to get into long legal arguments tonight, despite the fact I have in front of me barristers' opinions and goodness knows what. To me, I, I will agree with you on one thing, that it would have been much better had the legislation been framed to say that it was a binding referendum, and I would suggest that at any future national referendum, it has to be legally binding. Chris, I thank you for your opinion and your call. Clive in Mid Wales, is this a good day or a bad day for democracy, Clive? It's an awful day, Nigel, and it's great to speak to you, by the way. Thank you. I'll explain. Mm. Uh, we vote in this country for Her Majesty's government, and there, along with Her Majesty's government, we get Her Majesty's opposition. Uh, following the referendum, none of Her Majesty's opposition, not the Lib Dems, not Labour, not the SNP, none of them decided to challenge this in the courts. There is where our democracy is. They decided that democracy had been served, and that was the end of the matter. So we've then got Gina Miller coming in just to delay things. It's just a complete well, nonsense. Well, Clive, let me add one thing uh, to this, and indeed to our previous caller. Uh, UKIP did put in a bid to make representations in this case. We wanted to go to the Supreme Court as the one Brexit party in this country, and we wanted to give our opinion. And do you know what? We may have a small presence in Westminster, but, the, but prior to the referendum, we as a nation discussed this issue in the European elections of 2014, and UKIP is the number one party in the European Parliament from the United Kingdom. Would you believe, Clive, that UKIP were not allowed to make representations in this case. I absolutely believe it. Um, and they keep on about the judiciary being impartial. Uh, yeah. The truth of the matter is, you know, they are, many of them are career uh, lawyers and judges within the European net framework because we've been in it for 40 years. Um, so that is where their livelihood is based. And yeah. with the best will in the world, they are not, most of them are probably not impartial. Yeah, well, Clive, we don't know the full answer to that, but, um, but, but the fact is, as I say, the party that won the European elections, the first party since 1906 
that wasn't Labour or Tory to win a national election, our view was not wanted. So do I question the genuine independence of the judiciary in this Supreme Court judgment? Yes, I do. I wonder what Michael in Muswell Hill thinks. Michael, good evening. Well, Hi, hi, Nigel. Um, I don't think it was a great day for democracy. I think it was an average day for <laughs> democracy because the judiciary often often challenges the government. And, and I think having a check on the power of the executive is, is, a, is a good thing. You're not always going to agree with their decisions, but having a check on, on the ultimate power of the executive is, is sensible. So actually, I think it's an average day. And, and this, this, this sort of rhetoric about somehow, on the one hand, you've got the ordinary, honest, uh, uh, work in person, you know, uh, uh, as opposed to the elitist sort of uh, uh, lying judges, you know, who are enemies of the people. It's really shocking, uh, Nigel, and I, I, I don't think you should be seen to support it. Well, I haven't, I Michael. It. Michael, I haven't called them enemies of the people, uh, but I have said I'm concerned about one or two people that have been involved in this, and I do find the fact that when UKIP seek to make representations, given our track record, on this issue, it's remarkable that we were refused. Well, can, can I ask you one question, yeah. uh, Nigel? You, you, you constantly bang on about the you know, sovereignty of, of the people and, and the people should decide. And look, if you really, really believe in the sovereignty of the people to make right decisions, why, why are you so terrified of them being asked to make an, another decision with another referendum on the deal that is, is going to be done? I'll tell you why, know. Michael, because I've seen too much of this. I saw it back in 1992 when the Danes voted no to Maastricht and were forced to vote again. I saw it once again when the French and Dutch vetoed the European Constitution to be totally ignored and for it to be rebranded as the Lisbon Treaty. I saw it last year when the Dutch voted against extending a deal to the Ukraine and they were ignored. And in Ireland, I saw them twice reject referendums on European treaties to be forced to vote again in the most biased and heavily financially weighted circumstances. I have seen what the political class across the rest of Europe have done and now they're trying to do it in my country and I don't like it, Michael. So, so, Nigel, you believe in the power of the people to decide once, but you, you are, are saying, I don't trust them to make the right decision the second time around because they might be easily led astray. Because, by, by Michael, it's been bent. That's why it's been bent. And what I saw in Ireland after they rejected the Lisbon Treaty was the most dishonest referendum I've ever seen in my life. Ours may not have been perfect, but it was a damn sight better than that. Um, tweets I'm getting. For, I can't believe Parliament voted unanimously to give the people a vote, in or out. We voted out. A bad day for democracy, Leslie Wheeler. Well, it wasn't quite unanimous, but it was by a margin of six to one. Um, and another tweet here. What would happen if Theresa May ignored the High Court and went ahead with Article 50? Well, listen, she's already made it clear, you know, that, 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 that she is, she is going to get a vote in Parliament. It's going to happen pretty quickly. I hope it doesn't really matter. I hope that Labour decide not to destroy themselves. I hope that the House of Lords decide not to vote for their own abolition, because that's what would happen. Uh, but even so, I'm angry because I feel a promise was made to us and it hasn't been kept. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.30 and time for the news with Rupert Barsier. It's sort of like grown-ups, because they told us in this leaflet through every door, this is your decision. The government will implement what you decide. And now it goes back to the very same career politicians who for half a century have led us into political union in Europe without at any stage telling us the truth. And I'm angry about it. I think it is genuinely a breach of trust and your text coming in. Please tell me Brexit will not be unravelled after today's ruling by the Supreme Court, Tracy in Laleham. Well, if it does, Tracy, I'll have to go and buy a pitchfork, I guess, or something like that. It's a bad day for democracy when our judiciary put Parliament's view before that of the majority of voters. The electorate know their will better than those they elect. Michael, Facebook messages. Uh, Simon Peter says, the referendum was only advisory, not compulsory. Says so on the first page of the bill. Nobody has to do anything. Uh, legally, legally, 
uh, you may be under our... <laughs> given the way that legislation was written, Simon, you may be right. But I would argue that morally and democratically it is certainly wrong. Uh, and Stephen Smith says the British people elect members of Parliament to act on their behalf. We voted to leave, so they should let us leave. Yes, Stephen, but they're trying to amend the terms. Now, I've been mildly critical of the judiciary. Uh, I've been highly critical of many of our political operators. I've been very critical of some of the rich and wealthy that are trying to stop the Brexit process. But I've said nothing yet about the media. So I was up early this morning um, and I should have had LBC on. I really should have had LBC on, but I didn't. I had the BBC on and I listened to Gina Miller, who was at the centre of this case, described by the BBC as a philanthropist. Isn't that marvellous? I suppose tomorrow she'll be a faith healer. Or perhaps they'll... I mean, maybe she's heading towards sainthood. I don't know. But that sort of betrayal of somebody who is involved in a political action as clearly being on the side of right, I thought was absolutely appalling. Uh, and I, I wasn't critical of the BBC during the referendum campaign itself, they acted actually in a very even-handed way and full marks to them. But I'm afraid, I fear, they have now reverted to type. Philanthropist. So they're the good guys and we're the evil, nasty, bad guys. Oh, and Gina Miller said earlier on today, um, and this was on LBC, she said that uh, she was really surprised and upset at the number of attacks that she'd had as a result of this action and she thought that was because she was an ethnic person. Well, I'm really sorry, Gina Miller, but, you know, I'm a privately educated white person and I've received absolutely shed loads of abuse from many of the people who were cheering you on today. I'm afraid in the modern world and with social media, if you put your head over the parapet, don't be surprised when it gets shot at. It's not nice, it's not pretty, uh, and those of you out there who are thinking about a career in politics, my advice would be think again, because it's pretty blooming rough. So, I've now had to get the media too, and I'm feeling a bit better for that. I wonder what Deborah in Porter's Head thinks. Is this, Deborah, a good day or a bad day for democracy? Oh, Nigel, it's a disastrous day. Uh, hello, I'm so pleased to meet you. I follow you all the time on the TV, and I am just livid. I've had the most disastrous day. I've been up since six o'clock. Yep. Watching TV. Yep. I think Piers Morgan could actually make me cry, definitely, <laughs> at this stage in my life. <laughs> but this, on a serious note, I am getting more furious as the day goes on because Theresa May, does, does the country not realise that Theresa May is about to go out to meet Donald Trump on mm -hmm. Friday? Mm -hmm. This now puts us in a very weak position yet again, just as we think things are moving on, everything's gone two steps backwards. I'm gutted. Yes. And I think the Liberal Democrat leader, wow, he needs to be strung up. He's after a bit of your glory. I think he wants a bit of Nigel Farage glory. <laughs> because well, he is really winding me up. <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, I'm going to advocate or support the concept of stringing people up, um, but he is certainly damned annoying. I would agree with that. Uh, Deborah, you raise a very, very important point, that she now goes to meet with Donald on Friday uh, with, with some degree of uncertainty okay. hanging over the process. And now, what will he think when he meets her? Is, is he going to be so keen to do a deal that he might have actually had in mind already? We don't know how he's thinking. I certainly, I, I, I certainly think it's interesting, isn't it, that one of the main arguments that the Remain campaign used in the referendum was that if we vote to leave, there'll be huge uncertainty. And yet what they're trying to do is put uncertainty on the whole Brexit process at every stage. Deborah, you raise a really good point because, you know, Trump, Trump likes to see things in very, very clear terms. You know, it's yes or no, it's do a deal or don't do a deal. Uh, and I agree with you. I think this will bring some confusion. Uh, and if you're that livid, Deborah, you better pour yourself something in a glass, I think, because uh, otherwise you might explode. Thank you for your call. Tim French says on Facebook, I don't recall Parliament getting a vote when Ted Heath signed us up to the EU, so why can't we contest that? Well, actually, Tim, 
uh, we did. Parliament did vote in 1972 for a European Communities Act. Uh, Heath then took us in. Uh, and, and, and there are some that would argue, actually, Heath did use royal prerogative ultimately to do that, so why can't we do that to leave? But I tell you what's really interesting, that in 1975, the people of this country had a referendum on our continued membership of the European Economic Community, and guess what? The establishment won, and nobody challenged it, nobody took it to court, nobody asked for an immediate rerun of the referendum or claimed it was illegal and that's kind of the feeling I've got from all my experience in Europe and now seeing what's happening here is actually um, these people don't really believe in democracy they just believe in their own version of it. I wonder what Patrick in Battersea makes of today's judgment and its implications for democracy and trust between our politicians and the people. This isn't about trust between the politicians and the people, it's about the rule of law the rule of law today, this evening, says that Parliament will vote upon that ruling. That's what the rule of law says. You campaign to get our courts precedence over European courts. You campaign to get our Parliament to make decisions on the basis of British people's whatever they want. You have got what you want. What is your problem? Because I believed David Cameron. I mean, I must be a complete fool, but I believe David Cameron and HM government when they told me, this is your decision. The government will implement what you decide. That's the point, Patrick. You know, it was sold to us that whatever you decide, we will implement. And now the game is changing. Nigel. You have lawyers. They must have advised you. And I think I saw Maria Miller force you to admit that you knew that it was not binding on one Sunday morning. No, no, no. The she, fact... Yes, she actually did, actually. She forced you to admit the that, fact you that it knew wasn't binding. the referendum wasn't binding. The fact, they, the fact it wasn't binding, the Patrick. Court, you wanted the courts to make the decision. You wanted the British courts to make a decision and you wanted British Parliament to take precedence over everything else. Believe and you me, Patrick, believe you that's me, I've got, got plenty of legal opinion sitting on my desk that goes exactly in vain with three of the justices today who voted against this, all right? I think, you know, if we get stuck in these legal arguments, we are all going to be in a mess. And I haven't tried, actually, to make this so much about the judgment itself as to why it's happened and what this process is. And, Patrick, I want Britain to be an independent, self-governing nation. Yes, absolutely I do. But the point I'm making is that when you say to the people of this country, this is your decision, you can make it, I think it is a matter of trust when suddenly that appears to have been taken back to the very people who took us into the European project in the first place. Nigel, listen, the deal is that governments get beaten in the courts all the time. Yep. They get beaten in the courts on all sorts of issues. Theresa May has been destroyed in the courts over the six or seven years that she was Home Secretary. The deal is this. Governments can tell you what they want. Mr Cameron could sing whatever song he wants. When it comes down to it, it comes down to the Supreme Court, which is what you wanted. You wanted our Supreme Court to be supreme. And actually, that's what they've done. They've made a decision actually, that you Patrick, don't like, actually, and now Patrick, you're griping. Actually, Patrick, what I really wanted was for the government to do the other thing it promises in the referendum, which was to immediately trigger Article 50. That's what Dave told us would happen, and it didn't happen. And if Theresa May, when she took over, had dithered a bit less and triggered Article 50, we wouldn't be in this mess today at all. Uh, Patrick... We have a different point of view, uh, you know, and that's fine and that's good in a democracy to have that argument. Um, uh, your text coming in, the power of the people can come out in the next general election. All the MPs that have stitched us up can be sacked. Mike, well, Mike, I, I promise you, you know, if Brexit doesn't really mean Brexit, then I think we may well see in 2020, if that's what, if that's what it comes, a very dramatic General election, indeed. Nigel, whilst I agree an MP vote in Parliament should happen, the British people voted to leave, so they should vote in relation to how their constituents did. If they don't, the public will show their disdain at the next vote, James in Chesson. Yep, there's one or two of you beginning to say that, that, that if, if, if really, you know, if really our decision is not implemented in the correct way, there could be a huge political price to pay by individual MPs and who knows, maybe by Corbyn's Labour Party in two by-elections coming up in less than a month's time. Right now, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show exclusively on LBC.
Stid, this is your decision. The government will implement what you decide, is what that wretched leaflet that came through my door said. But there we are. Uh, it hasn't quite worked out that way. And I will, at the top of the hour, give you my final thought. Uh, but meanwhile, I'm going to keep taking more calls. And I'm asking people, is this a good day or a bad day for democracy? And I wonder what Liam in Cardiff thinks. Hello, Nigel. How are you doing? You right? Yeah, fine. What do you think, Liam? Well, I think it's a great day for democracy, Nigel. Absolutely yeah. a great day. I, 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 I mean, what I wonder is what you wanted people to vote for in the first place, because you want. It seemed like it seemed like you wanted sovereignty for uh, British Parliament, which I, I, I guess that vote was undermined by the fact that we had a vote on whether we'd be, be part of the EU or not, anyway, which kind of says that we had sovereignty anyway. And then when you get what you wanted, you throw your toys out the pram. This is sovereignty. This is this is what this is this is what sovereignty means. And I think, I think with respect, you you've you've dressed up sovereignty to uh, legitimise perhaps a, a, a less noble argument. I was uh, arguing, which was, Liam. Which, which, which was, let me finish, please. Which was which which was essentially your argument against immigration. Now. I think there are plenty of reasons to come out of the EU, and 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 I was a reluctant Remainer, I must say, um, based on um, based on the, bu the bureaucracy that goes on there. However, I, this, this, this sovereignty argument is just it's just a dead duck, and I don't know why you can I don't know how you can flog it. I think it's I think it's actually quite discreet. Liam, Liam, the reason I backed a referendum is I wanted that sovereign decision not made by Parliament. I wanted it made by the people, and whilst it wasn't legally binding because the legislation didn't say so i think in every other way it ought to have been binding and that's actually what that document that came through my door and everybody you know people don't read people who vote don't read bills that are going through parliament but what they do read are leaflets that come through their door but hang on there liam i'm not going to fight you I've, I've, I've taken on all comers so far jeff in epic i'm going to ask you jeff Liam thinks it's a great day and that we should trust our, our, our politicians and that sovereignty rests in Parliament. How do you feel, Jeff, about that? Hi, good evening, Nigel. Big fan of yours. I'll make it really easy for you. The, yep. the note came through the door telling us about the referendum. Yep. At 7.01, when the, oh, the election uh, polling station opened his doors, I was down there voting out. Right. So and me and the cat. The cat vaunted out as well. <laughs> so let me tell you, Nigel, I think you need to get back into control of UKIP. You need to go and bang the drum again because this is an undemocratic day. It's a bad day. I voted out. Yep. Um, it, we won the election. We won the football match. Um, you know, 2-1, 3-1. You can't replay it. We've made a decision. Let's get on with it. Right, Jeff. thank you for that clear vision. So, Liam, there are millions of people, Liam, like Jeff out there. They're part of the 17.4 million. They thought when they woke up on the 24th of June, if they'd gone to bed uh, last year, that we won this great historic victory, and now we're being told that Parliament could possibly amend it or delay it. Can you see, Liam, why people aren't happy? Yeah, I can. Um, but what I would say, Nigel, is winning the victory is fine, but what is the trophy? You know, the, the, you, you, there's been no defined prize out of, out, out, out of leaving the European Union, and you have manifestly failed to make that point. Oh, Liam. Um, you, you, no, how are we? <laughs> come on, you, you, come you, on. You, 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 you bang on about a leaflet that was sent to the door. We can also bang on about the, um, the, the, the bus, which admittedly you had little to do with, but also... The the, uh, the the billboards that you put around the UK, well, that's bloody disgraceful, mate. What, I the mean, truth? No. Liam, 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 let, let, let's not refight the campaign arguments themselves. There's no point in that. Um, but what I would say to you is, you know, however you feel about this, uh, you know, uh, and OK, there is this argument that sovereignty lies in Parliament, but I'm going to maintain until my dying day that actually... And, and interestingly, Tony Benn would have argued this had he still been alive, that sovereignty does not lie with individual politicians sitting in Westminster. Their authority is lent to them at general elections and then handed back to the people to decide whether they, they should continue to have that authority. The time that is broken and it changes is when you have a referendum and you go through an exercise of direct democracy. And I am, I am very, very sure that a very significant percentage of those 17.4 million tonight think something isn't quite right here. I wonder what Craig on the Scottish Borders thinks. Craig, good evening. Uh, good evening, Mr Farage. It's an honour to speak to you. Right, Craig, what do you think then, good or bad for democracy? Well, I think it's a good day for democracy, but perhaps right. for a slightly different reason than most of these callers. Go on. Well, it's been said now on, well, just on the news that 
Nicola Sturgeon cannot veto the decision for Article 50. She can't yes. block it. I mean, I, we voted as one big nation to leave the EU. Yep. Uh, and she can't respect democracy. She cannot respect democracy. She didn't respect it when I voted to remain in the UK. Mm -hmm. And she's not going to respect it to leave the EU. Well, Craig, I will agree with you on that. The one mercy, the one mercy of this judgment was that uh, they decided that uh, the Welsh Assembly, Stormont, the Scottish Parliament, you know, could not on their own make decisions on this. They give opinions, obviously, but they can't make decisions because we are a United Kingdom. So, Craig, I guess it's a mercy that that happened. But had it not happened, effectively, it would have been the end of the United Kingdom, wouldn't it? Oh, oh, definitely. I mean, she keeps saying, if we vote Brexit, we're going to have an NDRF. Didn't. Hmm. If we leave the single market, we're going to have an NDRF. Yeah. Didn't. Yeah. Mind you, Craig, I think that if they did have a second referendum, and, th and there may come a time to call her bluff, but I feel if there was a second referendum, you know, firstly, the oil price is about 50 bucks a barrel, and all their numbers had been based in the last referendum on $113 a barrel. Secondly, to, to join the European Union, you cannot have a debt GDP ratio of more than 3%. In Scotland, it's 10%. And how many Scots would actually vote to be part of a European Union that said they had to join the euro and wanted to be in the Schengen area? So I actually think that if there was a second referendum on this, where she wanted Scotland you know, to sign a new treaty to be, to be in the European Union, I think it would get rejected by a much bigger margin than the independence referendum of 2014, Craig. That's my view. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, good. Well, thank you very much indeed for that call. We got the Scottish dimension in there. Maureen Cuddy says on Facebook, I think it's a disgrace what has happened today. The next election, we can sack them all. Well, Maureen, you know, it may well come to this if people aren't happy. Um, tweet here, Cameron promised us he would immediately trigger Article 50. He bottled it. He lied. Why aren't we talking, taking him to court? Well, he's gone, um, Ann Cooper. He's gone. But uh, Theresa May, I, I, I genuinely think one of the reasons we're in this pickle um, is that Theresa May was indecisive. Now, it may well be that nothing comes of it. It may well be that they get Article 50 through the House of Commons very easily and all the amendments, all the amendments are uh, defeated. I hope that's the case. Uh, but there is at least a degree now of uncertainty about it. And I'm going to ask Hannah from the Elephant and Castle what she thinks about this. Hannah, good evening. Hi, um, Faraj. Um, I wanted to ask you a question, given that last conversation. I think it's a good day for democracy, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but the last, the last person you were just speaking to now was talking about Scotland. Now, you seem to have a very kind of specific, narrow... Um, and particular idea of what sovereignty means and who um, and who gets to be a part of this popular sovereignty. Yeah, voters. Vo yeah, yeah, voters, yeah. Hannah. Okay, voters. So what, presumably, I mean, every single, basically, council in Scotland voted remain. So my question for you is, OK, well, the UK, by and large, voted to leave the EU. And presumably, because we live in a democracy... MPs will, when they go to Parliament, vote in the way that their constituents voted. Now, if Scottish par Parliament members of Parliament are to do that too, then they would vote to stay within the EU because that is overwhelmingly how their constituents voted, and that is how sovereignty works. And for Scotland then to maintain popular sovereignty, for Scottish government, for Nicola Sturgeon's government to maintain popular sovereignty, it would have to stay true to how its constituents voted. So it seems to me like the way that you see this is we want sovereignty for racist, rich, white men. But oh, dear, dear, dear. Now, listen, Hannah, you know, really, you know, we, we can have a proper debate on LBC, but if you're going to come out with just drivel, then that really doesn't work at all, and I'm sorry about that. Well... My final thought on all of this is I left a career in business uh, to come into politics because I, I did not trust the establishment. And after today, I trust them still less. Article 50 will probably go through uh, without any great problem, but there is now a risk. What I do know is that all of us that believe in independence, all of us that believe in our country to be free, to make our own laws, we have got to keep the pressure up 
until this is finally done. There are many in the establishment there to thwart us. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm back tomorrow evening from 7. Coming up at 10, it's Ian Collins. But next up, it's Clive Bull. Nigel, thank you.